and hit good afternoon everyone hope you're doing well um, it is Wednesday. This is our last Innovate VC of the year. So we're super stoked to have our two guests, our two friends um, joining us today. So it's Dale and Colleen from ECDC Consulting. They are here and they're going to teach us 13 things. But before we officially, officially get started, we're just, just want to acknowledge, um, you know, you joining us you coming, you know, whenever it works for your schedule, or maybe you watch some of these recordings, but we just want to acknowledge, you know, the listeners, the audience, thanks, thanks for being here. Thanks for taking in these webinars. There's some been some fantastic knowledge that has been shared, some amazing resources that have been given in the past year. So we're just really grateful you're joining Innovate BC in partnership with Can Do. So thanks for joining us. Um, you know, before anything, I always like to take a moment and, and give a shout out to Creator. This is why we're here. Um, Creator's gift of Mother Earth, of this land, the sacred waters, all our relations. Yes, I see, I still see the white rabbits out there. I also hear birds out there in the midst of our cold here in Amiskwichi, Wisconsin, so Edmonton Treaty 6. Um, but we also think about our relatives, our family, our chosen family, our neighbors. And so we just give thanks for the circle of life that has been given to us that we're a part of. So hi, hi, creator. We give you thanks for the gift of this day and this opportunity to be here in a virtual community. So thank you so much for being here. Um, all right, so on to today's topic, you're going to learn 13 things that you need to know for successful economic development and who's going to lead us, who's going to teach us. We got Dale and Colleen, so honored that you are here. Um, I love these two folks, and so I'm, I'm excited that they're here to present because they always bring um, such good information. I think I can call them the dynamic duo. So welcome, welcome. <laughs> a little bit about Dale. He has 26 years of economic development experience and is the CEO of the BC Economic Development Association and one of the founding partners of EDCD Consulting. So starting out as in economic development in a rural BC community, he then moved to Chilliwack where he worked to make Chilliwack one of the leading economic development communities in BC. Like Dale, what? Amazing. He is in demand as a speaker with a presentation style combining humor with simplicity for understanding the complex issues. And I can attest to that, that he, um, creates such good presentation that even I can understand. And next is Colleen, um, who is a certified economic developer with 24 years of economic development experience, extensive knowledge in building economic development programs for business retention and expansion, business attraction and foreign investment attraction. She has worked from grassroots to government organizations and a variety of community development and capacity building roles, earning awards along the way. Shout out to you. Uh, she co-founded EDCD, and then they're gonna tell us all about it, consulting to provide consulting and services to economic development agencies in all levels of government. So I feel like we are in good hands this afternoon. So welcome. So honored you're here. And you have the last word of 2021. So I have some great wow. expectations for you. So I'm passing this virtual mic off to you. And at the end, there will be opportunity for any questions or comments. And feel free to use that chat box um, throughout the presentation. And I will definitely make note of any questions that you have. All right, I'm passing the mic. Welcome, welcome, Colleen and Dale. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, you know, Colleen, I don't know about you, but I almost feel intimidated talking after Michelle talks because <laughs> so much energy and so bubbly. It's just, I, I don't think that from all the hundreds of presentations we've done this year and last, I don't think anybody does it like Michelle does. So, Michelle, it's. <laughs> We are having a beer. Now, the other thing I really learned when Michelle was talking, Colleen, 
that's actually really good for you and I. And, and we really need to keep this so we don't want Candy to change it or Michelle to change it. And we don't want to ever give them updated information because every time she speaks and she says, how long we've been in the business, I feel younger. Because <laughs> I guess we better update that, eh? <laughs> but the lesson to stay younger as you get older is to never update your bio. Perfect. Yeah, Perfect. that's right. That's right. <laughs> And the dynamic duo is pretty good. Obviously, I'm Batman. You're Robin, but that'll become clear. So, uh, <laughs> Captain Canada or whatever, Captain America. I wonder if it could be Captain America. But, uh, not looking so good in those types. Of things, but whatever, it's okay. It's the uh, so let's talk about the 13 things you should know about economic development. We're really happy to be here. I'm actually on the traditional and unceded territory of the Silic Silicon people. Um, located here in uh, sunny, not so sunny today, Penticton, and uh, that's where I live and work, and uh, happy to be here. So, um, I'll just start off quickly with just uh, I also, in addition to working with Colleen and, and, and her boss with PDCD Consulting, um, the uh, I, uh, I run the Provincial Economic Development Association here in BC, so we're not for can do, if you will, but we are provincial based and. Uh, we have a lot of indigenous communities that are members of the association and uh, some uh, on our board of directors is uh, Trevor uh, Gooch from um, why, uh, Hawaii First Nations on Vancouver Island. Uh, Trevor's been uh, on our board for a number of years. He's currently serving in the capacity of secretary. And, uh, and then we also have Rocio from uh, Skolo Community Futures out of uh, Tula. I can't say your last name because it's so cool. We'll see you. And uh, so we, yeah. So it's we do a lot of different things similar to what uh, Candy does. And then over to Colleen. Colleen, I'll let you manage this. Let's see how much younger I look in that picture. <laughs> no. Uh <laughs> Uh, yeah, we won't spend a lot of time on here. That's right. Dale and I are, are partners with uh, uh, in the EDCD Consulting, and we focus on economic development. And just as Michelle said, sort of more of those rural communities is, is our focus for sure. Uh, you know, one thing that is missing on that slide here in front is the work that we're doing uh, that's getting more and more and more a part of what we do uh, is disaster recovery and, and working with communities and bringing back their local economies after disaster hits. And, and uh, unfortunately, uh, that is becoming a larger portion of our, our, our work. Uh, and I say unfortunately because obviously it's because of disasters that are happening. So we will talk a little bit about that later on in the presentation, but uh, we'll just get into the, the 13 things as uh, we seem to talk a little too much and run out of time at the end and squeeze things in. So let's get to it, Dale. All righty, Colin. Sounds good. So the 13 things. It's both community economic development and economic development. We talked about uh, when Colleen and I first got into this industry back in the early 90s. Um, we we uh, typically you worked in two different, you worked in these little silos. And you had you had economic development over here, and a lot of the focus on economic development was really trying to bring new businesses into a community, into an area, into a region, and really uh, you know, building building that part of it, and, and then some other group would be taking care of those community development aspects. And but as time has gone on, rightfully is what it, what has happened is that you now get that combination. You get you're building community and the community and the way of life and creating a, 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 a place, if you will, and combining that with your traditional economic development activities. And actually, there's lots and lots now around attraction of new business but instead working to create business working to encourage entrepreneurship working to keep the businesses that you already have in your communities and then building those those uh places where people can gather and and share and learn and and you're doing all kinds of different things similar to what this um facility here does uh, as a community kitchen in it um and uh you know and it, and it so it not only is is a place where people can gather but it's also a place where sort of the economy works so you have that combination of both in, in uh economic development to together yeah uh yeah you're right and and you know 
they were so separated before and now there's, it's almost seamless, especially for communities that are doing economic development well and community development well. It should be seamless and, and it's, it's looking after, uh, you know, the next generation as well. It's being that mentorship as well that, that we're, we're seeing that, that seamlessness and that crossover again between community and economic development. And, and it's really talking about and developing uh, a better quality of life for our residents and for our citizens, uh, along with ensuring that there's a, uh, a strong economy going on and that our businesses are strong and our businesses um, are there to, to be supportive, not only of other businesses, but again, of the community as a whole. And, and it's, really, it's really good to see that evolution coming through. Uh, and I think it'll just continue to get stronger and stronger as we go further on and still remain, you know, with 26 ex years experience and only 24 for me. So. We won't age through the, the new evolution, but, you know, it, it really is what's happening in, you know, on the ground in those communities that are doing successful uh, economic development, for sure. And then, of course, we need to understand what our, what our economic development staff does. And, and it's, it's like, if you will, try to use an example that's very close to home here. It's important that uh, people like... Um, your board of directors of your organization or your, your chief and council or or uh, the, the partners in your development corporation uh, they understand what the economic development staff does it's, it's important for an example that trevor know what michelle does uh with can do so that they they understand that the individual impacts that these staff are, are making uh within an economic development organization but i think as Colleen will talk about, is it really goes both ways. You can't just expect a board member uh, or, or a committee member to know what staff does. If, if there is some responsibility, I think that goes the other direction as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and yeah, you're right. It goes both ways, right? So you know, it used to frustrate me when I was uh, an economic development uh, practitioner on the ground. I, I was uh, in economic development here in the Central Okanagan in in BC, and um, it, it would drive me crazy when people would not understand what economic development was, right? I mean, I thought we worked really, really hard, kind of explaining what it is we do, or or maybe assuming that people should know. And and I think that was that was the um, that was probably it, a realization that we assumed people knew what we were doing as economic development because we saw the results. Uh, we assumed our community saw the results and knew that it came kind of came back to what, what we were doing as an organization. But once we sort of clued in that maybe we actually have to kind of hand this out a little bit more to our community members and to our board members and to our key stakeholders and that sort of thing, we really did be key, become um, the go-to organization for economic economic development and community development and really got recognized for what we were doing. And it's not about being recognized, but it is being about um, individuals and your businesses knowing who they can contact and who they can call for assistance, right? That's what you're there for. You're there to help your, your businesses grow. You're there to help your entrepreneurs uh, find out what different programs are on uh, in, the, in, the, in the province, uh, whether there's federal programs, whether there's local programs, any of that sort of stuff, right? So without you actively going out and communicating what it is you do as an organization and why you're doing it and what your successes are, which we'll talk a little bit about too, Dale, um, it, it, it's, it's that part is your responsibility. But I will say it is, you're right, Dale, it's, there is a responsibility for those other people to kind of say, okay, you know, I've heard of economic development. What is it you guys do? And just make sure that you have that open door and you can have that conversation. And there's so many different ways that communities can, can uh, announce and, and participate in community and, and let them know what they're working on. I remember one of the, one of the areas we went into Colleen and we were, we were talking to the leadership of the community and we, um, they, they said, well, you know, we never really know what the economic development staff is doing and they don't tell us. And we said, well, well okay, and, and we understand that. Have you gone and ever had a, said, hey, let's have a coffee or let's, you know, let's sit down and chat about what's going on. We'd love to hear more about what are those things that you're doing. And they started to do that. And it started to build a much closer bond between the economic development and the leadership of the community by them by them talking more and communicating more about what each other's 
A, what each other is doing, but also what each other's sort of expectation and wants are as well. So it, it allowed, you know, allowed both sides to sort of adapt and, and to create a, a good working uh, relationship together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say, you know, if there's anybody who's new to the profession, um, it's a great opportunity to really solidify uh, the, the organization and, and what they do and, and the expectations, as you said, is, you know, if you're new to, to economic development, new to a community to do that role, um, it, it's really important to, you know, focus that first little while on getting to know who's who in community and going out there meeting with them and, and talking exactly just what you said, Dale. Really? So having a, a strategy in place is, is a, another key part to successful economic development. And, and the reason we say uh, it, uh, having this strategy in place, having a plan in place, it really guides you as an economic developer, but it guides your community as to where you're going to be, where you want to be. What are those steps that you need to take? What are the programs? What are the initiatives? What are the strategies that you need in place to understand where you want to be as a community, who you want to be as a community. And, and there's lots of different ways that a strategy can be developed. Um, you know, I think automatically some communities will think, oh, geez, well, you know, I got to call in uh, a consultant or I got to, uh, you know, spend all this money. I got to write a grant to, to get it and, and all of this work involved. So I don't, you know, I just don't know if I can do all that. And it, it doesn't have to be that way. There's lots of affordable ways that particularly smaller communities can put a plan into place for economic development. And we'll talk about one in a couple of slides from now that, that would be a real key sort of foundational piece to kick off a strategy. But, you know, it's not something that as an economic developer, you're going to do on your own. Um, having a strategy in place and having those plans and finding out what community wants means getting community involved, right? It's meaning who are your partners? in your economic development? Uh, who are your stakeholders? Uh, what key businesses and what are your key sectors? All of that sort of thing is, is being uh, pulled around and, and you know, sit down in a group and, and have the discussion of, of you know, what are you currently as a community? What's working for you? What isn't working for you? Where do you wanna be in a year from now? Where do you wanna be in three years from now, five years from now? Uh, that sort of thing. And you know, I, I, I'm giving kind of timelines, I would, stress one thing when you put together a strategy for economic development don't go too out there we, we do see some communities who who say okay well let's put a, uh, a strategy in place for 2030 now so you know a 10-year plan uh, i guess it's closer to nine now but or eight even but you know they look at a 10-year plan or, or even further down the road uh, and that's just too far for economic development things change far too drastically and and quickly and and i think the pandemic has proven that so if you had put in a plan into place a 10-year plan in 2019 well i can guarantee you that's just sitting there doing probably not much of anything with the pandemic or the uh, unfortunately the disasters that we've seen here in British Columbia with the flooding and the fires. Again, if you're out there too far, your, your plan is not going to be worth too much. So stick to a smaller period of time, sort of that three year, maybe five years, but three years is a good one to target for. Um, and then just look at it every year and find out, just monitor it, evaluate it uh, to make sure you're on target. Again, what's working, what's not working in the plan. It's just made of paper, it's not in stone. So it's flexible and it should be. Yeah, Colleen, the, um, I mean, I think the thing that we see when we've gone into communities uh, and done their, their economic development plans is, is uh, so many times previous plans weren't implemented and a lot of times they weren't implemented because they just weren't realistic. They were trying to lay out expectations of things that realistically with that community of 300 or 500 people or or maybe it's a community of 500 people with a much larger area to work at so it doesn't maybe address some of those things that should be touched on or it addresses things that realistically are not going to be touched on because the community doesn't have the capacity uh to bear to to be able to to implement it and the other thing we typically find when we go um, and, and, it, and it really kind of does bother us is there's a lot of, and as much as work, we're consultants, sometimes we're our worst enemies in the sense that we find some communities spend too much money on that planning phase and there's no money left at the end for the implementation phase. And, and that a good plan should lay out 
this is the, the plan, this is how much it's going to cost you to implement. But start being a little bit realistic in how much money you really need to pay to have that good plan, a realistic plan uh, developed for your community. So we're happy to, to talk about that with, with anybody. Uh, sort of what's that reasonable amount. The, um, be realistic about your readiness. And I think this is one of the things that that Colleen mentioned that can that can really help build that strategy for you to, to help uh, to help kickstart um, a strategy for your communities and, and I, I think we have a, a self assessment don't we Colleen that we can share um, on on getting your community ready for investment or for economic development period and, and there's a lot of that basic work that maybe we don't even have in place so those should be the first things that we're taking care of as we go about doing an economic development program and developing an economic development strategy is making sure that we're putting in place those foundational uh, items that, that you need to have to be successful uh, in economic development. Chloe? Uh, yeah, the, the, the readiness um, sort of self-assessment that, that you're talking about, yeah, we'll certainly share it through CanDo, but it's also on our website, just right on the front page. You can click and download it and, and fill it out, no problem at all. Um, but it really walks through sort of five or six or so uh, different components of economic development, right? It's, so it does talk about your readiness because do you have a strategy in place, right? What are your foundational tools? Do you have a community profile? Do you have a website presence? How do you deal with inquiries that may come into your, your office, whether it's somebody local who comes in and says, I'm, I'm thinking of starting a job to maybe something a little bit larger with a, uh, you know, somebody coming in from another province perhaps and saying, I want to um, have a, a company started here in, in this community. So, you know, how do you deal with those inquiries? And, and do you follow up? So there's lots of different things that, that it'll test you on or ask you about. I, I hate to say that it's a test. It is more of an assessment because it's not about a it's not about a pass or fail by any stretch of the imagination. It's really about being honest with yourself and where you are in your capacity, where you are in your readiness for economic development. And then it will identify where those gaps are. And that's why we say that this is a really good starting point if you don't have an economic development strategy uh, already. Um, if you're just starting to kind of look at that, this is such a good starting point because those gaps will be identified. That can be your maybe your first year work plan, right? Um, and use it that way. Make initiatives and strategies based on those gaps that might be there. And then, you know, take the, the assessment again a year later and, and see where you're going. And, and again, I would say this is not something that you do alone. This is with economic development, it, you need your partners, you need your stakeholders, you need your community involved. Um, so when you're ready to do a self-assessment, gather a few folks around the table and sit down and, and all kind of have that discussion and, and find out you know, whether this is in play in the community or, or this isn't. Um, so it, it's really a great starting point uh, for the, the community discussion as well. I mean, to understand your local and regional assets, and so many times, um, whether we're um, Indigenous communities, whether we're an individual local government, um, or however we're, we're structured, we have a tendency to look within our, our specific area instead of looking much broader into what is realistically, where, where are those services that we use as communities because those are really our assets as well as, um, uh, and I say our assets being the community's assets. So if you're in, if you're in the Hawaii First Nations on Vancouver Island where Trevor is, um, you know, Port Alberni Airport is their asset. The, the hospital is their asset. It's, uh, they're, they're, they're all, it's so important to recognize that as an asset in your economic development efforts. If you're ever out looking for somebody to come to your communities and make an investment, you want to talk about those assets, those assets that your community has access to. And again, whether they're in your territory or whether they're in sort of the region, they're still look, still look at them as your assets. We see this in, uh, in a lot of rural communities here in British Columbia in the particular areas like uh, say the Burns Lake area, um, where they're all sharing those assets within the, the individual communities uh, to the benefit of the community, be it community economic development or economic development purposes, 
everybody is using the assets collectively as their assets. And so it's important to know what those are. Uh, for an example, in, uh, uh, you know, in Kelowna, the, you know, the West Bank First Nations is using the Kelowna International Airport as, as their asset. Or, um, you know, we've seen that in, in the Flin Flon area in Saskatchewan, Colleen, or, or wherever you are, is look at your broader areas to see what the assets are that you can actually capture as your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, people who aren't familiar with your community uh, or your area, they don't see the borders, right? And there is no border, right? So, you know, talking about Kelowna and West Kelowna and, excuse me, and the West Kelowna, or so the um, West Bank First Nations, it, it, it's seamless from driving from one area to another to another. You, there, there's no, no border up there or anything. And, you know, in West Kelowna, for, for sure, um, you know, our assets uh, definitely is the number of businesses that we have in West Kelowna. And I can guarantee you the majority of those businesses are located on uh, West Bank First Nations land, right? So, but they can, they are considered uh, a, a central Okanagan, if you will, um, asset, doesn't matter where it is. And as I said, people coming into communities that are unfamiliar have no idea where one stops and the other begins. It's, it's actually interesting, one of the, I'm living in Penticton here, Colleen. One of the, the first points, uh, uh, things that you see, and we always talk about sort of those first impressions as to what you see when you're pulling into the community. And I, I can remember for years and years and years driving here, I always focused on one development, and that was the Red Wing. And it was a beautiful housing development on the waterfront with multiple housing. I, I like you said, I would have no idea where it was, but I really think that particular development kickstarted so many other residential developments, and it's all on Penticton Indian. Now. It's this beautiful residential development that that now then became sort of a regional asset to attract other developers into the area to uh, to do other to do a, additional projects. Hey, 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 There's a saying that you honor your past by investing in our future. Working together gets the goals that we need to get better and faster. It's been a big step towards more acceptance on all sides. We're trying to change a paradigm here. First Nations Municipal Collaboration is important for a few reasons. If communities collaborate, they're planning together, they're developing local economic development plans or environmental sustainability plans. We're all living in the same country and collaborating at a community level is so important for understanding each other, for living together. The core of our partnership has got to be communication. We shared the same schools, the same playgrounds, hockey rinks. Uh, we knew one another, but our elected officials didn't have a venue where they could communicate regularly. But now with the SETI program, we meet at least once a month, whether it's police and fire services, healthcare, education, public works. The foundation that we've created is just a strong network of communication now between EDOs, councillors, mayors and chiefs, and even the citizens in all three communities. We have formed a partnership between the two communities in the Autochtone, one community in the Autochtone. What we did, we had a vision together. We put a focus just on tourism. So si on n'avait pas d'autres partenaires, ça marcherait pas. It's moved us forward, getting to know each other, getting to know the history. It helped to facilitate. It helped to get the parties all in the same room, in the same place, got them talking, <coughs> looking for projects that they could do together. Our people are Muskegs at first, the Cree Nation members first. But we also still feel that as though we're Edmontonians. Uh, the MOU and the partnership just gives us more ownership together in a mutually beneficial way. We've been neighbors with Enoch First Nation for more than a century and yet it's only in the last few years that we've started to act like neighbors. I think the most important thing uh, about the work that we did was we built relationships, and we built friendships and we built trust. You know our teams do work together and I like the exposure they get at the municipal level at those tables for development. This gives uh, investors a lot of certainty and a lot of comfort knowing that 
we can build relationships with other jurisdictions. Collaboration between municipalities and First Nations is extremely important. We need to focus on helping our communities advance their own agenda in terms of employing our people, getting them training, and uh, doing other wonderful things around community development. We've entered into a period of reconciliation as Canadians. We want a, a better outcome. And it's not for me personally, it's for our children. To me, that's what Canada's all about. Now, I, I really love the SETI program, and I, I know that Ken New runs uh, the SETI program and is, I know, advertise, I think they're advertising right now for calls for communities. If that's, I'm, I'm not sure if that's already closed. Maybe Michelle uh, knows that or Elsie. But um, I really, from what we've seen, uh, we've seen good, you know, good uh, success stories coming out of that particular program. And, and I would encourage um, any of you to, to sort of look at that to see. I know that if, even if you can't get into the federally funded program, that uh, because there's a limited amount of money that can be gets for it uh, in, in partnership with, with FCM. Um, I wish there was more, and I know that our provincial association is going to, to be fighting for more money for it, uh, for can do to have to be able to work with uh, local governments and local Indigenous communities to get those partnerships and dialogue and discussions going. It's so important uh, to have that if you are to have those strong partnerships uh, for both to have successful um, economic development initiative. And so um, it actually, Daniel, it's, you say it's closed uh, and those partnerships will be contacted next week. Well, we hope to still fight for more. And I know we are meeting with, uh, hoping to be meeting with Ken New and Victoria uh, in early 2022. Um, and, and hopefully work towards some form of a partnership to be able to bring uh, more funding to this program. So again, just watch for it. And if there's that opportunity to apply for more funding, I would encourage you to, to, to look at this because I do think it's a really good opportunity. Um, Colleen, what, did you have any uh, comments on this section? Yeah, well, there's the, we, we can talk all day about having those, those proper uh, and strong uh, partnerships with regards to economic development, whether it's with your neighboring communities or or uh, different organizations, uh, you know, economic development is definitely not something that you you do on your own, and it's through partnerships that uh, that really help with your, um, you know, with the implementation of your strategy, with with uh, getting things done. It, it helps with the capacity issues. It helps with the human resources uh, and and the dollars. Uh, as well. I mean, we all have to have some funding for sure to, to get things done in our communities. And, and without the development of those strong partnerships, um, uh, sometimes things are just going to fall off the, the, the table. They, they just can't be done. And, um, you know, one thing I, I would say about uh, partnerships is, is it, they have to be nurtured. Um, you know, I've, I've found that uh, I think when, when I was doing economic development for, as I said, here in the central Okanagan, a huge part of our success was uh, that we really focused time and effort on developing our partnerships and maintaining those partnerships is really finding out, um, you know, who we needed to be talking to and, and having that regular contact. And, and that's really, really key um, is having that regular contact with them. And I know sometimes it can be really challenging, particularly if you're trying to do partnerships at, um, at some different government levels, uh, you know, maybe provincially or, or federally. Uh, unfortunately, what we see in with our experience anyways, that um, a lot of times the people that you've, you've had that relationship with uh, is that individual uh, from perhaps this specific ministry or, or what have you, or department, um, they end up leaving or, or, you know, getting promoted or going somewhere else, whatever. And you kind of have to start all over again. And, and it can be a bit frustrating for sure, but I can guarantee you it is worth it. Um, as I said, I know a lot of our success 
was because we put that effort in to make sure that, um, you know, if one person left, we started from, you know, foundation again, who do we contact? How do we contact them? How do they like to, to be uh, chatted with that sort of thing? And, and just really nurture those relationships. I, I can't say enough about how important they are for, for being successful in, in economic development and honestly in life, you know? <laughs> So yes, we talked about you know when you're when you're looking at your strategies and making sure that you you know you put a lot of these foundational pieces in place and and, and looking at your your readiness for investment and there are a lot of foundational pieces that you can put in place and uh, you know whether it be a, a community profile uh, that that talks about the community again not forgetting you want to talk about that much broader community that the neighboring communities the neighboring regions and. And because those, you know, business and businesses looking or people are looking, they want to know sort of what's all around there, even whether it's for tourism or whether it's for investment or, you know, small business, whatever it is, you know, the more information you can provide, it, you know, the better it will be. And there are some great examples out there that you know, we can provide, or I'm sure can do has examples of a good comprehensive community profiles that are with the uh, township of Chapeau um has has theirs and then there's the uh um white cap first nations as you can see on the screen have theirs and i believe that one is a website uh we we really typically uh will tell communities to not spend your money on printed documents everything should be web-based nowadays everything should be available online for you know businesses or investors or individuals to be able to download uh, if they want to be able to print it or just to look at it on the screen. So all of the information can be available in a comprehensive website that really doesn't have to cost, again, a lot of money uh, to, to develop. I mean, there are affordable options out there uh, for, for decent uh, websites. Uh, and it also helps in your communications with community members. Uh, you know, if they, you know, when you start that process of developing a website and it's got information on there, you're slowly educating the people to check out the site for that more updated information. So it's important to be able to keep it updated as well. And then of course, social media, and we can't, you know, it's, you know, social media is, can sometimes be uh, bad and sometimes it can be good. And, and it is good from an economic development perspective, as far as highlighting those things that we talked about earlier, those things that you've done, those things that you've accomplished, maybe upcoming events uh, or things that you're doing in your community, but each type of social media has a different role. And so if you're talking to community, Facebook is a great place to communicate to. If you're talking to uh, business, LinkedIn is the best place to communicate to. So if you're promoting business or promoting partnerships in many ways, the best location for that is to do it through LinkedIn. Um, and then Twitter, I don't know, like personally, I, I don't know if I focus that much on Twitter, maybe Colleen uh, disagrees, but I mean, Twitter is, can get lost. Your, your tweet can get lost in, in uh, with so many other tweets that may come in or may, you may be linked to other groups or individuals that are part of it, their tweets are coming in. So the message you're trying to get across can actually be lost in, in what it is that you're, you're posting. So you know, just look at your different, your Instagrams, Colleen uses, I know she uses it a lot. Um, I'm still trying to figure it out. So I can't, uh, um, even though it's amazing to me that Colleen's older than me and she gets it and I'm still trying to learn it. So, uh, but uh, Colleen, what about other, those, some of those other foundational pieces that we need to learn? Well, we don't usually talk about it too often, Dale, but I'm pretty sure it's still around, it's Townfolio. Um, now they or, or have they moved to a different model because I, I know when they first started uh, they had demographic your basic demographic information on all communities uh, so that's a really good starting point but did they change their model and and you have to have a process of changing it so a lot of that information is disagreeing so same with the province oh, okay. uh, has removed a lot of their data that they used to have available online. Yeah, and you know, that's a good point. I would check with whatever province you're, you're in, uh, because there are some provinces that uh, develop their own community profiles for um, 
uh, for their communities, like individual communities or individual regions. In British Columbia, uh, that used to be something that they did. They haven't done it for many years now. Uh, I know Alberta used to do it. I'm pretty sure Manitoba uh, used to do it. So again, depending where you are, it's something good to check out or check out those greater um, uh, associations that you may be part of, uh, whether it's through economic development or perhaps there's a sort of a, that um, economic marketing uh, region, some, you know, some associations that way, uh, they may have those profiles too that, you know, don't reinvent the wheel if it's there and already done, take it as your own and, and use it. Well, well, yeah, you know, Dale, whenever we get to this slide and whenever we start talking about engaging with your businesses, we always say we can talk for days and days and days about engaging with your businesses and, and the importance of uh, doing it and, and, you know, the why you should and, and, and the value that that is there. Um, and, you know, I think with uh, the pandemic and with other disasters that um, communities, unfortunately, are experiencing, uh, you know, the value uh, of engaging with your businesses um, before there ever was any disasters is really becoming clear how important it is uh, once a disaster hits. Uh, it just, it's, it's I, I, again, I can't say enough about how important it is to engage with your businesses. You know, as economic development and, and community development, you're really there to, to make sure that your businesses are strong, uh, that your businesses can, um, uh, can, can pull from a, a nice labor force that's trained and, and ready to go, um, that uh, is, is there to, to move your community forward in that direction that, that as a community you've agreed upon. And, and without engaging with those uh, businesses to find out, you know, what their challenges are, what their successes are, um, but what their needs are, what programs could you develop as economic development that would help them succeed more, would help them, you know, get that goalpost even closer to them. Um, you can't do it by guessing. So you really do have to go out into the community and engage with your businesses and Sometimes the hesitancy that we, we hear from communities is that, you know, well, I don't have very many businesses, so I don't need to meet with them. And, and you know, I would argue uh, against that in some way. You know, I would say even if you only have half a dozen businesses or a dozen businesses, it doesn't hurt to, to go and just have a, an informal chat or, or a formalized chat in some way and, and find out what's going on with them because we don't know. And, and you know, what I think we see too often in economic development is, is, you know, driving through our communities um, and there's an empty building there, an empty storefront. And you kind of went, huh, something used to be there. I can't, I can't remember, but something was there. Uh, I wonder what happened to them. Well, if you were engaging with your businesses, perhaps that business still would be there. I'm no promises, right? But by engaging, there might have been a, a situation that had come up that could have been rectified, that could have been, um, you know, solved in some sort of way. And again, when we talk about engaging with your businesses, it's not something you do alone. This is where you have your key partners involved and your stakeholders involved to to help and and build up your your community as a whole. You're you're all in it together, and and uh, um, so yeah, engaging and, and knowing who your businesses are is really, really important for successful economic development. And I, and I think, Colleen, as much as, um, you know, we focus on bricks and mortar. And, and so if there's, you know, a physical infrastructure there, then we focus on that business. But there's also the, those businesses that are located out of the homes. And, and they may be contractors. They may be, you know, uh, technology design a business. Or they may be, you know, doing programming or doing something but they're working out of their homes but they're also creating an economic impact they're 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 adding you know maybe that job is their own job or maybe on the outside they're employing other people who are also working out of their home and so we need to we need to be engaging with with you know, especially in the smaller communities we need to be engaging not only with the bricks and mortar but also the homes uh, and the home-based businesses that might be in your community because they have the potential of growing beyond the community or growing beyond the, the home and into, uh, you know, maybe a physical location uh, where they're setting up. And I think one of my favorite ones always was Colleen, and I think we talked about it in the uh, entrepreneurship coming up, but is, is the, um, the Bannock Cafe, the, I think it's the one in, was it in Kelowna or wherever it was? And, and I think, you know, it's a good example. Start with something small, a food truck, and and uh, and then go beyond and setting up something else. And I was I was just last week uh, speaking at a couple of weeks ago speaking at a 
an event put on by, by NISCA in, in Vancouver. And, and we had a number of businesses there and it made me think of the, of the Bannock one. There was this lady I was introduced to called the Bannock Queen. And, and uh, her business name is going to be there's the Bannock Queen and she's looking to expand, but she's working out of her home. And she's, you know, so she is a business that's creating impact uh, from the destination. Oh. Yeah, uh, hand in hand with uh, with that is is definitely the entrepreneurial uh, environment. Uh, so you know those are your new businesses, right? So those are sort of you know if we look generational, <laughs> that entrepreneurship is that you know that next generation that's coming up to 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 be your business community, and it's it's so important to to foster that whether it's youth. Uh, or, or whether it's, you know, we're, we're starting to see the sort of that gray, what, what do they call graypreneurial or something? So the, the more of the senior people who have such a vast amount of knowledge um, of, of doing business or vast amount, just knowledge in general, that, um, you know, it's important for them to still remain active and they want to remain active and they want to contribute to, to the economy and to community that fostering it doesn't matter what what the age is it's it's really important to just have the policies in place to have that open door to have those conversations about what entrepreneurship looks like and and what you can do and there's some really good programs out there to assist uh, particularly the youth in starting their own businesses uh, but just talking about that as an option for them i think i think for a lot of times uh, particularly youth perhaps don't see that as a viable career, if you will. Uh, and I, I think we need to be uh, more open to the discussion on uh, what what it is of being your own boss and what that means and, and how that their idea can be taken much further than perhaps they think it can be. And and a lot of that starts with language. I, you know, it drives me crazy when I hear people talking about how hard business is. And I, I mean, it is, okay. I'm not saying like, Let's put on our, you know, rose colored glasses or what have you. But we've got to stop some of that language of it's really difficult to start a business. Oh, my God. They all fail within, you know, the first five years. Um, you know, you'll never find funding. You'll never be able to market properly. It's, it's, it's way too different. You'll be working seven days a week, you know, 24 hours a day. Oh, that's impossible. But anyways, um, so I think just having a, a, a more um, forgiving language about uh, entrepreneurships and the opportunity that they can actually have with that uh, and encourage that uh, would be better in our communities for sure. We've seen so many examples, Colleen, of smaller businesses starting off in that home or just as an individual entrepreneur that grow into mega companies. And, and, and we need to, you know, so, so things can't happen. It depends what the vision is, where the goal is of the business to where, how big they want to get. But we, we need, so we need to nurture them. We need to help them get to the next phases of business. And, and I would encourage all of you to reach out to different organizations like like Futurepreneurs, Colleen mentioned the youth. Futurepreneur is a great organization to work with, to, to work with uh, your, your youth, the, young, the younger, you say younger, I think it's 39 and under, uh, into you know, getting into their own business. They help them with business planning. They help them doing lots of other types of, uh, of things to get them to that level, including financing. Uh, and then you also have WeBC or um, here in British Columbia, which is used to be what used to be called the Women Enterprise Center. I believe it just changed their name to WeBC. And, and, it's, and it's about helping women get into business. And so we need, to, we need to look at all of those things and how can we partner with them to come into our communities and to help our entrepreneurs get to that next stage in their, in their cycle.
I just love that video. It, 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 I don't, I don't know what it is. It's the music, the pictures, and combined and the energy. I, I just, I think, I think what I like about it is that the community is saying we have something special, and we want to know how you see that special. What, what is it to you that makes up the the, the, the area, the the Mistassini, uh community, and what what is it that drives people to the community, and and, and they want to know from. And those that live there, what what those experiences are, and, and of course, building that whole tourism community, uh, a, a destination, if you will, and, and they want the community to be part of that. Uh, I think it's it's important that as communities that you recognize your tourism assets. One of the things that if you want to build a tourism economy, you want to you want to expand the tourism industry in your communities, is to know what that industry is. What are those assets? That, that make up the tourism, whether it be, you know, the land, the, the culture, the, you know, the food, or what, it, what is it that you can do to highlight what your community has to offer and to share with those that visit? Because there are people that want to visit and experience the, you know, experience it. And so make sure that you, you properly capture that uh, and so that you can share it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And there's lots of different ways that you can use your tourism assets. And we, we, we talk about them all the time. And, <laughs> and we've yet to see it really in a community. And there's such simple things. I mean, you know, a, a really simple thing that we, we would say to a community is, is using your tourism assets uh, as uh, your hotels. Uh, you know, a lot of times communities or, or visitors are in your community or in your region. They're staying at hotels and they're kind of curious about what else is out there. And they're curious about um, um, uh, things, not only things that they can do as, you know, as individuals or as families, but, you know, what, what kind of businesses are here? And if you're an attractive community, which I think in Canada, for the most part, we're a very attractive community um, that, you know, I kind of visit and I think, geez, what are my business opportunities here? And using a hotel room to put in a, you know, a simple flyer or one sheet that says, hey, you know, welcome to our community. Here's some business opportunities, right? Or here's what we're looking, we're looking for tour operators or, you know, whatever it is, something super, super simple that you can do that doesn't cost you any money. Uh, and then you've got entrepreneurs coming into your, your hotels, you know, every day, pretty much that are there and why not use them but we'll get we'll get a community to do it one of these days one, Dale, one i'm day, sure one, one day yeah and it can be a you know it can be a hotel it can be a camper it can be whatever you know yeah. like if whatever people are stopping make sure that you're highlighting that information about your community and what those opportunities are i think you know, you're right yeah. one day we'll see people stop in a restaurant yeah yeah yeah, yeah. celebrate those small things colleen how did you do that? Well, this is this goes back to talking about that communication piece and and letting people know what you do is economic development. If you don't tell them what you do, nobody knows, right? So celebrating just the small things, like maybe it is that you are uh, looking to do that investment readiness assessment, right? Well, talk to the community about it, right? There's a small little win. Hey, we're ready to see whether we're ready for investment in our community or whether you're going to start going out to your local businesses celebrate that say hey we're going out to our local businesses and this is why we're doing it and this is the benefit that we're going to hear and and um or, or we're going to collect from it and and that sort of thing maybe you've done a community profile let it, the people know like anything that you are doing is a little success and each little success gets you closer to your end goal, right? It's you start developing your strategies, you start implementing your strategies, you start reaching your strategies and start again. <laughs> it's never ending, but start again. But there's nothing too small to, to celebrate and let people know that, that you're doing it. Yeah, and, I, and I do think, you know, we, we kind of take the small things for granted and we just do them, but we don't talk yeah. about them. We need to talk about them so that we are informing the communities and the funders and that as to the types of accomplishments that are happening because we're all working together and one of those just an idea i don't know it's just a thought but maybe you know when you prepare like a flat sheet or something that you put in your campground and say hey these are the opportunities celebrate that you've done that so that way we get that win maybe if somebody says <laughs> that they've done it send it to us so we know that you're doing it yes exactly <laughs> we want to celebrate it with you yes 
<laughs> how can we measure our success? Well, we have to measure the success. And this kind of goes again back to you've developed your plan. You've got your key stakeholders, your partners all around the table. You know where you're going as a community. Uh, you're, you're celebrating those successes as you start to implement the, the plan. Um, but you really have to measure it as well. You, you can't just think, um, you know, oh, I, 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 think, I think we've accomplished something, right? You really have to look back, particularly at your, your strategy or your, your plan that you've put into place and find out where, where it is, you know, over the, the year. What, what strategies made it? What, which strategies didn't? Your failures are just important to recognize as, as your successes um, because it's not bad to fail at something. It just means something changed or didn't work or, or something like that. So really measuring what that is and, and, and you can just determine what those measurements are, right? Is it the completion of, a, of an initiative or completion of a strategy? Is it the development of a, a program? Is it meeting with X number of businesses? Is it having um, uh, X dollars of investment into your community? Is it uh, expanding your partnerships by, you know, 20%? What, whatever it is, whatever speaks to you uh, for your community um, is what your measurements can be in, in your plan and developing them. But you do have to, um, I would strongly suggest, look at it on a yearly, year-to-year -year basis to see what's working and what isn't. Yeah, and, and again, it's, it's don't be afraid of the fact that you may have failed and not accomplished something, but... Um, I think it really goes, you know, measuring that success really goes back to creating those realistic strategies, those realistic things that you can achieve as a community. Um, and you do that by bringing people together, by the communication of your local residents will help you determine what are those measurements that are, that are meaningful to the community. And, and instead of focusing on some document that, that, it, that itself, that somebody on the outside created unless they created that in the consultation with, with the community. And Colleen, this is the last one. This is number 13. And as much as I think it should almost be moved to number one when we start this presentation, the sad thing is, is that when we would do that, if we did that, it would take up the entire presentation, the way that we have been going in the last number of years, that it has been disaster after disaster after disaster. And as much as when we do these full day workshops on making resiliency and recovery the new norm, we start off with the day and we say to people, look, it's not if, it's when. And all we need to do is look around our province of British Columbia right now and, and that mm -hmm. the disaster that has happened that, is, that will go down as the most expensive disaster in Canadian history. And it's unfortunate as you look around the province and you look at the, the communities isolated in the Fraser Canyon, like, um, you know, Kanaka Bar and Lytton and, and, and those areas, and, you, and how that's going to slow down the community of Lytton's recovery from when they lost their town in the summer. Or when we look at Highway 8 and that important uh, transportation network between Met, uh, Merritt and Spencer's Bridge, and, and how the communities that between there have been isolated and separated and taken away from their individual communities, their friends, their families. All of these things are, um, are, are creating huge impacts throughout our province, but not only this morning, Pauline, we talked to the communities in the states that are being impacted by, uh, by the uh, tornadoes, uh, or the type, mm -hmm. whatever the heck, about hurricanes or whatever. But everybody is getting impacted by disasters, and we need to figure out a way to make that resiliency and recovery the new norm. We need to make sure that our communities, individually and regionally, are better prepared to respond in the event of a disaster in how we rebuild them. And, and I think we can't say enough how important it is. For you to take the necessary steps, form those partnerships uh, with regional areas, regional communities, with your neighbors, to make sure that nobody is forgotten when we get, uh, because that's all the economy. Every aspect of that is the economy, um, and we need to we need to make sure um, that we're better able to respond quickly uh, to to those types of economic impacts and so forth. Uh, no, sadly, our time is up, but uh, the next slide, I think, gives our contact information, and we would be happy to 
you know, if we've got a few minutes, answer any questions or please feel free to, to shoot us an email or what have you. And we're happy to, to talk to you there and, and answer anything that way as well. All right. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That's your 13 things you need to know for successful economic development. I think that one thing that I really heard again and again is about community and connection and partnership that, you know, we're not meant to walk in this journey by ourselves. We're meant to do this together and grow together and build together and to support others. So thank you so much. Just quickly, we have very limited time um, because they brought such rich information and such good content. There was so <laughs> much ground to cover. Does anyone have a quick question for our guests? Presenter? Ken, you can always count. You can always count on me. Uh, uh, I, my question is: Are you doing anything with um, Fort St. James? Because th they're on the Highway of Tears. But when I last looked, they still haven't got a bus replacement bus service to the last one for uh, the Greyhound. And I know that um, I sense in Ottawa uh, that there is anguish uh, and uh, desire to do something, even though personnel have changed. So uh, just uh, uh, a word to the wise and sufficient, there is anguish in Ottawa. They want to do something about the Highway of Tears. And the last time I looked, uh, uh, Fort St. James still hasn't got a... Um, a replacement bus service for the lost uh, Greyhound. That's no, all I have. Thanks. Um, was that Ken? It was Ken. So yes, thanks, Ken, for that. Yeah, we. Uh, I mean, we we individually um, are not. We have do have people in the uh, in the area that that are members, and we know that you know there are. I think there is work constantly being work uh, trying to argue for some of those types of support and I think they are dramatically needed throughout there. Not only not only the bus service, just better communications along that entire corridor so that, that people are never left out there stranded. Well my my argument was that uh, if you look at all the transportation for support St. James, not just busing, but all everything that moves on wheels, maybe somehow you can you can put together a business plan for the, the whole whole of uh, whole of transportation for Fort St. James. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ken. That, that's, I mean, and a very important point that you made up. So thank you for bringing that up. I, I, our time is up. I am so sad. But look, they left their contact information. So if you have a pressing question, um, feel free to reach out, shoot them an email. I believe this slide presentation will be made available. It will be emailed to those who are here. Um, so thank you, Colleen and Dale. It's been a pleasure again to sit and listen um, to your knowledge and, and your experience, your many, many, many years of experience. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for being here. This is it for 2021. Who knows what's to come next year? Um, I hope you have a good rest of the day. Um, and there's been good feedback in our chat box. So thank you for your good information, good presentation, uh, all of those good sentiments. Um, you know, we're not on this journey alone. You know, we have creator, we have the land, we have all of our relations all around us. So tap into those things. We are coming into a new season. Winter is just, well, winter's here in Edmonton, but the new season is coming just around the corner. Um, make those good relations, um, walk in a good way. And I, I just want to thank you again for being here. So have a good rest of the day. Peace, everyone. Thank you. Thanks Bye. so much.